All right, so we just heard about if you're over 50, the law applies, taxes, goofiness. Has everybody got that calculation thing, right? Pretty complicated. Do I have full-time? Do I have part-time? Are they temporary? Are they seasonal? Hopefully you got a really good payroll system that can spit out all this data for you because you're going to need to really assess and, and understand. A lot of small employers say, well, thank God I only have 36. I don't have any part-timers, so that part-time equivalent thing doesn't, doesn't work for me. I, this law, I'm, I'm off the hook, right? Well, not so much. So what happens as a part of the Affordable Care Act, we talked about the, uh, if we read the base of the Statue of Liberty, the weak, the huddled masses, right? We've talked about the people who are already sick and they're not on an employer-based plan. They don't have anywhere to go. And this is the part of the law that I wholeheartedly, 100% am in favor of, because uh, I have a lot of folks who had ended up because of an economy that caused them to be unemployed or because of their health status, they can't maintain full-time employment. Those folks many times are left behind. If they're under age 65, Medicare doesn't help them. Uh, we currently have a health insurance marketplace if you're an individual that is not mandatory coverage, right? So if I apply and I'm sick, I'll get declined as it is today. What the law now says is after January 1 of 2014, everybody is guaranteed issue, right? So no matter how sick you are, you could be literally HIV positive, stage four cancer, sign up for insurance, come on in you're gonna pay a similar rate to the healthy folks because the other thing that they've now done is change the way health insurance is underwritten for small groups. So today, if you're a part of a small group, you fill out a medical application. Anybody ever use the form fire, right? There's an electronic online, you go in and you bury your medical soul to a machine and then it spits out, okay, you're this sick on a scale of one to 10, you're too sick or 10 sick or somewhere in the middle. That's gone. What we now have is community rating. Um, and today, where we have health statements and we rate on gender and age and geography, smoker status, Medical Mutual has 36 rating tiers. Tier one being that healthy marathon runner young group and tier 36 being the, I wish we didn't really have to offer you insurance, but we do because Ohio Small Group Reform says we have to, right? So you could be somewhere in the middle. Well. After January 1, 2014, Medical Mutual is going to have four rating tiers, not 36, four, and they're able to ask you really a few things. What zip code do you live in? What is your date of birth? Smoker status guy's still on the fence uh, because Ms. Sibelius and company decided that if you base your rates on smoker status, you have to provide something called a reasonable accommodation, right? What a reasonable accommodation is if you smoke is Agreeing to participate in a smoking cessation program is a reasonable accommodation, and therefore you couldn't be rated up for smoking. You don't have to quit. You just have to say, I'll enter into a smoking cessation program. Now you can't upcharge me as a smoker. So most of the insurance companies have thrown smoker status out and said, we're not going to do that. The life insurance companies are, can still use smoker status, but the health insurance companies cannot. So what we're going to come up with now is, if you're a really young, healthy company with pretty preferred rates, you're going to be regressed to the same mean rate as that really old, sick company who has really high rates, right? So I'm going to guess not everybody has studied statistics, but you've probably all heard the term regression to the mean. Basically, everybody's going to go to a common rate, but because of the anti-selection issues that we've talked about before, that mean rate's going to move up substantially. The other thing we've got going on in small group reform uh, as a part of the Affordable Care Act is we talked about those. There are 10 categories of coverage that must be offered. Maternity, newborn care, prescription drugs. Some small group plans limit coverage today to keep it affordable. That's out the window. There's also a limit on deductibles. How many folks in the room have adopted a high deductible health insurance plan to keep your costs in line? How many folks have one over $2,000? Okay, that plan is no longer lawful if you're a small employer after January 1, 2014. You can combine your HRA, your health reimbursement arrangement with your high deductible plan, and as long as the out of pocket doesn't exceed two grand single and four grand family, you're okay. But I have lots and lots of clients, we at the Fidelity Group, as a matter of fact, offer a $5,000, $10,000 deductible plan to some of our employees. That plan will no longer be lawful after the first of the year. So. Let's talk a little bit about affordable and, and kind of where, where we're going to keep these costs in line. I'm sure a lot of you have considered and maybe have implemented wellness programs inside of your employer plans. 
Many of those wellness plans have evolved into saying, okay, not only are we going to have a wellness plan and we want you to participate, but we're now going to base your rates on your overall health status. That's okay. That was actually allowed under HIPAA. It's been clarified under the Affordable Care Act. And we now have final rules with regards to tobacco prevention. But again, kind of like many things the federal government does, they gave it to us and said, smoker status, we really want to make those smokers pay more. But we're going to take it back because now we're going to give them a reasonable alternative. So, but I do have a lot of employers who say, OK, if you have a high BMI, if you have poor cholesterol, if you have high blood glucose, you're going to pay more for health insurance than someone who's extremely healthy and on our plan and manages their health better. That is allowed by law. It's discriminatory, highly discriminatory, and it's allowed by law. The differential in rate, if you include smoker status and provide a reasonable accommodation, can be 50%, right? So that really healthy employee could pay 100 bucks a month, and the employees who's not so healthy could pay up to 150 bucks a month, 50%. We have participatory plans versus health contingent plans. We didn't really have legislative action on that health results related plan. We now do. It's called health contingent. And as you might guess, there's a whole litany of regulations you now have to follow if you're going to have a health contingent plan. Who's heard of a company called Bravo Wellness? I'm surprised. They're a local Westlake based company that's got national acclaim because they kind of wrote the book on these health contingent plans. Those folks know the regs very, very well. We use them many times with our clients. But I will tell you that you see these five rules listed there for reward-based plans. It's becoming increasingly difficult to stipulate contributions based on health status. Many employers, I work with a large hospital system down in Summit County, they've abandoned their health contingent program because of the reasonable accommodation rules. Wellness that works. Well, again, I think we all agree, and I said a part of my call to action to you before we finish today is personal responsibility. I think we all agree that we should have programs that promote the overall health of our employee base. And I think we all as employers want our employees to live happy, healthy, productive lives, not be sick, not be morbidly ill. But there's, a, there's kind of a, a balancing point between being big brother, right, telling your people how to live their lives, don't smoke, be skinny, eat the right foods, uh, versus all the regulatory issues involved with, with challenge, challenging our employees to do that. So I, I think we're going to continue to fight that battle, and we talk about that in our wrap-up remarks. Um, the other thing that we're going to see a lot of, so we talked about that young healthy group. That young healthy group is probably looking at a similar rate increase to the older sicker group. Many of them are going to say, wait a minute, what are my alternatives? We're going to see a growth in the self-funding of employer space. What does that mean? Employers will bear risk where they hadn't done that before. As it exists today, if you have less than 100 or 150 employees, it doesn't make great sense for you to consider self-insuring. But because of the growth of entities like healthcare captives and stop-loss insurance companies coming way down market, now if you have 20 or 30 or 40 employees, self-insuring will be an option for you. So if you're not talking about that with your uh, employee benefits advisory, you ought to start because there's going to be some new opportunities for you to self-fund to keep those costs in line. Other reporting and compliance requirements, we've got all kinds of them. Uh, w reporting, under 250 employees was delayed, but the idea of that is uh, as we prepare, prepare in 2018 for the Cadillac tax, we need to know as the federal government what's the value of your health plan, so W-2 reporting is coming. Um, Everybody should be familiar at this point with something called an SBC, a summary of benefits and coverages. Uh, the federal government thought that this is an amazingly complex business, and they thought that the SPDs or the uh, summaries of benefits that we were giving out to our employees were too complicated. So they decided in their wisdom the size of the font and the format upon which all of the communication pieces should be. And the language has to be in very simple, plain English. It can't be in any sort of legalese in deference to our legal friends here. So the SBC is something you should have distributed last year. If you didn't, please do. It's a regulatory requirement. Notice the coverage options. Again, guidance is coming. Uh, we got some guidance on the 18th of May. Uh, Non-discrimination, we talked about that. Control group statutes are being applied. So again, to, to Mario's point, you can't have a 100 employee group and split it into 250s. If it's commonly owned, it's one employer. Additional IRS reporting. Grandfathered plan notice. Does anybody still out there have a grandfathered plan? All right, congratulations. Those are dying a pretty slow death. Uh, used to be there was some pretty significant advantages to staying grandfathered. Today, most of those are gone. 
So what is this? This is what is your situation. For those of you in the room that are Fidelity clients, and I, I know there are a couple of you here, um, in the front row, I think, um, we're doing something called a situational assessment. And what that is, is we're asking you for a whole lot of payroll type data, wages and hours, all that kind of information so we can sit down and take you through a process to tell you exactly how this law applies to you in great detail. So you can make strategic decisions on future hiring, future staffing, are you going to sponsor benefits for folks that you haven't sponsored it for before? Are there other alternatives? What funding mechanism might work well for you? If your current advisor has not done that for you, I would encourage you to call them to do it or find a new advisor because you need to really take a very hard look, regardless of whether you're a two-life employer or a 2,000 employee employer, this law is going to impact you, possibly substantially, possibly not. Here we look at some industries and how they're going to be impacted. Um, Red would be highly impacted. White, light blue would be not very much impacted. Again, I'm a part of the financial services insurance industry. Not a lot of impact for us because we're going to continue to sponsor the plan we've always sponsored. Again, the legal and professional services folks, again, to attract and retain the best, the brightest, so we can do the greatest work we can for you. We're going to need to continue to do this. Again, in the technology and software space, we got a lot of young folks in that, in that space. But as you can see, Retail, hospitality, food service. At Fideli, we have three significant industries that we represent. Construction, food service and hospitality, and healthcare. All three of those industries are massively impacted by this law. Healthcare primarily on the payer side. Your situational assessment should look at things like affordability. Is my plan affordable to my employees? Does it offer minimum value? Do I have to apply for the automatic enrollment provision? We, you see, we see question marks there because the jury's still out on that. Part-time variable hours, Mario talked about, very, very detailed discussions need to be have, held on part-time variable hour. And then which taxes apply to me? Depending on if you're self-insured or fully insured employer, some of these taxes would apply, but we're talking about things like a reinsurance fee, a PCORI fee, an insurer fee. We're going to hear from our friends in the accounting profession now to talk about how are we going to generate enough revenue to pay for this massively expensive law. 